A new world order is emerging, a new axis of world powers with common grievances and one common enemy. No prizes for guessing which one, the United States of America, a country which has for decades tried to shape our world in its image and established its preeminence in almost every facet of power, be it military, economy, technology, culture, or morality for that matter. It is America the world looks up to, all thanks to its global influence networks and, of course, the American PR machinery. But what if I tell you that things are changing? That America's global empire is crumbling, the hegemony of Western nations is dying, and a new alliance is looking to replace it, an alliance led by three countries, Russia, China, and Iran. The three most sanctioned countries in the world. They seem to have formed a rather informal alliance of convenience, a loose alliance of sorts which the West is calling a troika of tyranny and a triad of bullies. What have they done to deserve such titles and can they really reshape the prevailing world order? Or will they instead push the world into further disorder? And above everything else, where does India fit in this new axis? Does it have any reason to worry? We'll find out over the next few minutes. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. My name is Priyanka Sharma. A new global alliance is now in the making, an alliance between China, Iran and Moscow. They're forging their strategic, defense and economic ties. It doesn't take a genius to notice the pattern. Just look at some recent developments. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, the three countries have come closer. Yes, China is uncomfortable with the war. But it still provides Russia with a diplomatic umbrella. It is also helping Moscow economically by rejecting the G7's price caps on oil. The same case with Iran. It is still buying Russian oil and sending weapons in return. Yes, for the last one year, Tehran has sent countless kamikaze drones. And if reports are to be believed, it might just send ballistic missiles by this October. These deals are being accompanied by state visits. Leaders and officials from all three countries have been frequently flying to each other's capitals. In July last year, the Russian president went to Tehran. He met his counterpart, Ibrahim Raisi, and discussed strengthening bilateral ties. Contrary to expectations, Iran didn't downplay this visit. In fact, it rolled out a red carpet for Vladimir Putin. The Iranian oil minister personally went to greet Putin. And then in November, a group of Russian security officials visited Iran. Their aim was to find ways to counter Western pressure on both countries. Syria is another good example. Another good example of the Iranian and Russian interests coming together. For years now, both sides have been trying to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. Their only aim is to counter American interests in Syria. Just last week, the US shot down Iranian-made spy drones in Syria. And if we speak of Russia, despite being militarily involved in Ukraine, Russia still maintains a military presence in Syria, an indication that it's not leaving the country anytime soon. And if we speak of Russian and Iranian cooperation in Syria, it's a tale that gets murkier the deeper you dig. Russia continues to provide a decisive cover to Syrian and Iranian-backed ground forces in Syria. And then, of course, we have China. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russia's Putin recently caught up over a phone call. This was around New Year's Eve. The two sides released statements saying the ties are at their historic best. What's more, Putin said he's expecting a state visit from Xi Jinping soon. We are expecting you, dear friend, was the message from Moscow. We are hardly surprised. The entire world knows about China's bonhomie with Russia and we'll focus on China's love affair with Iran. An affair getting intense by the day. You see, in 2021, China and Iran signed a 25-year comprehensive strategic partnership deal, a deal that has given China its deepest ever foothold in Iran. With many Iranians even saying that the deal has literally sold Iran to China. But the Islamic Republic's leadership doesn't see it that way. Why? Because in return, Iran was made a permanent member of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a body led by China. It's the largest regional organization in terms of world population, global GDP, and geographic scope. Iran's membership in this body does little for the region it represents, but more for the powers that run it, Russia and China. 
With Iran on their side, their ambitions of countering the West get greater legitimacy and support. For Iran, this membership helps it battle the economic isolation from the West. So it's a win-win deal of sorts. In December last year, China's Vice Premier Hu Xunhua flew down to Tehran and more recently, Iran's President visited China, Ibrahim Raisi. He was in Beijing from the 14th of February to the 16th. The Chinese President gave him a red carpet welcome, followed by a guard of honour by the Chinese military. The arrangements were grand, to say the least. They had to be. After all, this was the first state visit by an Iranian leader to China in almost two decades and Raisi didn't go to Beijing alone. He took along a huge entourage of ministers. The biggest Iranian delegation to Beijing ever. This included six members of Raisi's cabinet. In an editorial about the visit, China's mouthpiece, The Global Times, said that the visit was proof that an anti-Western front is growing. Allow me to quote the most telling excerpt from the report. It said, China's deepening cooperation with Iran also has an anti-hegemony and anti-bullying feature. Both China and Iran uphold independent foreign policies, firmly defend the principle of non-interference in internal affairs on international occasions. If anyone feels targeted in this process, then they should first reflect on whether they are too selfish. So how do we perceive such statements and developments? Do they indicate the consolidation of an anti-Western axis? Do they indicate the rise of a new world order? It certainly seems like it, and the American media can't stop talking about it. For the last two months, there have been endless reports of how China, Iran and Moscow had joined hands against the West, how Washington will have to take on all three at the same time. And not just these three. Reports say the triad also has a posse of sorcerer's apprentices. What do I mean by that? Smaller nations that agree with their vision, namely Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cambodia, Myanmar, and the most important of them all, North Korea. A country which of late has been flexing its ballistic muscles way too much. So to put it simply, China, Russia and Iran want to unite all like-minded countries behind them and use them as a solid front to counter Western hegemony. This seems like a page straight from the Western Alliance building playbook. In the days ahead, you can expect these countries to go all guns blazing on the West. You can expect to see them blaming the West for their ills on global forums and using their vote at the UNSC or the UNGA to thwart the multilateral system. The big question, where will all this leave India? Will India be collateral damage in this game plan? Well, we wouldn't go so far as to say that. You see, India has historic ties with Russia. India and Iran also share a cordial relationship. China is obviously an exception. It never fails to provoke India. Yet, New Delhi and Beijing have managed to not let the tensions flare up dramatically. So should India worry about this alliance? We don't think so. This triad just has one rotten apple as far as India is concerned, China. I don't think the other members of this alliance, both present and future, would square off against India, especially Russia and Iran. One can't imagine these two joining an anti-India alliance. In fact, this alliance isn't even about India. It's about the West, its monopoly, its dominance, its brazen lectures and its selfish wars. My point is simple. Russia, China and Iran may have their own ulterior motives. They may have their own differences with the West. But their plan might find takers simply because way too many countries are fed up with the West treating the world like their playground. Waging wars at whim. Imposing sanctions at whim and preaching to others at whim. Their superpower status may have crumbled, but their sense of entitlement clearly has not. And this sense of entitlement is exactly what's uniting others against them. Think about it.